So hello to all and welcome to all of you for joining us for the first of the Japan Studies Association's Staying Connected webinar series. Very pleased to see you all virtually. We realized fairly early on that the COVID pandemic would make it impossible for us uh, to gather as usual in Hawaii for our annual conference. However, through the wonder of Zoom, a technology in which most of you are now extremely expert, uh, we realized that it was possible to gather and enjoy each other's company uh, with a series of presentations furthering the mission uh, of the JSA. Now, before introducing our first speaker, uh, I need to thank my program co-chairs, uh, Andrea Stover and Maggie Ivanova, uh, and of course, Joe Overton, JSA president, for their assistance bringing this concept together. Uh, the board of the JSA, Stacia Bensel, Faye Beecham, Jim Peoples, and Dawn Gale uh, also provided much help and advice. Uh, and a double shout out to Dawn Gale uh, for helping us get support for our programs from the University of Kansas Center for East Asian Studies and hooking us up with Jody Dietz, coordinator of Johnson County Community College's Collaboration Center, uh, and Sarah Bios and Isaiah Reesby, uh, who are handling the technical aspects of our program for us. So thanks much to all, uh, and of course, to all of you uh, attending today. Uh, I'm willing to bet that this is not the very first webinar for most of you. So in that spirit, I'll run through our program briefly. Uh, I'll introduce our speaker and hand it over to Bill in just a moment. Bill will talk for about 25 minutes or so, 30 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for comments and discussion. Uh, if there's a question you're just dying to ask, please submit it via the chat function, uh, and I'll put them to Bill. Uh, feel free to use the chat function to keep in touch with your fellows, and private side conversations are definitely encouraged. Uh, so without further ado, uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our first speaker in the JSA's Staying Connected series, Professor William M. Tsutsui, currently the virtually visiting scholar at the Reischauer Institute at Harvard University. Uh, the moment we conceived of this series, I knew Bill would be the first person we approached to contribute to it. Bill's service to the JSA is of long standing. He was one of our keynote speakers the last time we actually gathered together in Hawaii, you'll recall. Uh, over the course of his career, with which I have been associated for over 26 years now, he has served as Professor of Modern Japanese History at the University of Kansas, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Southern Methodist University, and President of Hendricks College from the fall of 2013 to 2020. Industrial production methods and banking in Japan were the focus of his early research, but I'm sure all of you recognize Bill's main contribution to Japan scholarship in his work on Godzilla uh, and Japanese pop culture. Indeed, he is currently teaching a well-enrolled course for Harvard on the history of monsters in Japan. However, he has also contributed substantially to the growing field of the environmental history of Japan, especially the relationship between Japan and its maritime environment. And today's lecture will draw on that work. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you William M. Tsutsui, who will be talking to us today about the Velveeta of the Sea, Kamaboko, uh, all yours, Bill. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate that warm introduction. It's a joy to be here with you. I wish I could be gathering with the JSA uh, along Waikiki Beach, uh, as is the association's uh, habit, but next year, uh, let's plan uh, on that. I'm just going to share my screen. It says uh, I have a disabled screen sharing. I am hoping one of our uh, hosts can help me uh, with that. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, say, uh, uh, I hope everyone uh, is doing well. I hope everyone is staying healthy. Uh, and I hope uh, that everyone is staying sane with the beginning uh, of yet another semester of hybrid online uh, or otherwise uh, very, very different teaching. Thank you so much. I am now going to PowerPoint it up. Let's hope this works. My computer is trying. Does that work? Good. So uh, let's talk a little bit then about surimi, the ground washed, treated, and frozen fish protein product that is the basis for a wide range of processed foods ubiquitous in Japan and internationally. It would be difficult to visit Japan today or at any point in our lifetimes and not encounter something manufactured from surimi. Fish paste products usually known generically as kamaboko, and I'll talk more about terminology in a moment, have deep roots in Japan and are almost unavoidable in school lunches and bento, floating in bowls of noodles, at New Year's and other celebratory meals, 
as a kid's snack in the form of fish sausage and bobbing in the broth at the seasonal Oden counters in convenience stores. And even if you don't recognize the look of an Oden counter, you will remember the smell. If you've smelled it once, that will stay with you. For many non-natives, and increasingly for younger generations of Japanese as well, kamaboko is very much an acquired taste, or more specifically, an acquired texture. The distinguishing characteristic of, characteristic of Japanese fish paste products is their elasticity, a quality called ashi, politely described by many Westerners as chewy, or more frankly, rubbery. In the interests of full disclosure, I should note that I am one of those people who has scrupulously tried to avoid kamaboko my entire life, and I would also be perfectly content to never again eat that most common global food stuff made from surimi, imitation crab, otherwise known as crab sticks or sea legs. Surimi and the products manufactured from it went from being a personal culinary aversion to a topic of research interest about eight years ago now, when I happened to meet someone named Paul Josephson from Colby College at an environmental history conference. Paul introduced me to an article he had published in 2008 in technology and culture called The Ocean's Hot Dog, The Development of the Fish Stick. Even before I'd read this piece, which is a really, really wonderful study uh, of technology and marketing at Gorton's of Gloucester, now a subsidiary of the Japanese seafood conglomerate Nippon Suisan, I recall chiding Paul that the benighted fish stick, though certainly worthy of scholarly attention, is not the ocean's hot dog, but that instead Kamaboko is. For today's paper, uh, you'll notice since uh, the uh, moniker hot dog of the sea is therefore already taken, uh, I have decided uh, to christen Kamaboko the Velveeta of the sea, which I think works uh, as well. In any case, from that moment eight years ago, I started collecting citations, clippings, and books related to Japanese kamaboko. But only later would I discover, and I hope you'll agree after listening uh, to this presentation today, just how promising a topic surimi is for exploring the history of Japanese fisheries, the evolution of the global seafood market, the international politics of marine resources, the technological and environmental implications of what's called engineered seafood and the dynamics of diet and lifestyle in modern Japan. My comments today will pivot on the transformation of kamaboko from a Japanese regional specialty based on local fish catches and small scale artisanal production into a sprawling global industry serving international markets through the integrated mass production of a new processed food commodity, frozen surimi. This transformation was driven by changes in the Japanese diet, commercial opportunities, and by environmental constraints on fisheries production after World War II. It was accelerated by a series of technological breakthroughs and adaptations, most of which were made by Japanese fisheries corporations and marine research facilities. And the process was profoundly shaped by resource nationalism and the politics of what's called the Oceanic Enclosure Movement in the North Pacific. That's where uh, states began to claim uh, oceans as their territory as well as land. The story of Surimi provides a unique perspective on one of the central narratives of fisheries and seafood markets in the 20th century, the rise and fall of Japan as the world's leading fishing nation and the top exporter of seafood products. It also casts valuable light on shifting consumer preferences, convenience, healthy eating, value in both developing and mature seafood markets. Above all, the history of Surimi is a sobering example uh, of what oceanographer Daniel Pauly has called fishing down marine food webs, in which fisheries, quote, having depleted the large predatory fish like cod and tuna, turn to increasingly smaller species, finally ending up with previously spurned small fish and invertebrates. Surimi, even better than the more celebrated sexier examples of cod and tuna, shows how the industrialization of the oceans, the globalization of seafood, and the degradation of marine environments have progressed with inexorable efficiency 
thoroughness and speed over the past half century. Now, before I really get into it, let me just apologize. Kamaboko is one of those topics with a kind of rich materiality that makes it a true joy to study. The very specific and complex nomenclature, the diversity of products and local traditions, the geeky joys of food science and fish protein chemistry, the appetite killing details of food processing technology. But for someone who loves trivia and the fine texture of both history and industrial production as much as I do, trying to tell the story of Kamaboko in a way that focuses on the forest as well as the trees, or perhaps in this case, I should say on the school as well as on individual fish is a considerable challenge. So apologies in advance for what might seem like a bit of a deep dive into the details of fish paste. There's no better place to start than with terminology. Japanese fish paste products are generically called kamaboko, although kamaboko is also a specific steamed form of such products. The technical term used in Japan is suisan neriseihin, kneaded seafood products, or simply neriseihin. Surimi as I mentioned a moment ago, is an intermediate product in the manufacture of kamaboko. To use a somewhat charged metaphor, surimi is to kamaboko what ammoniated beef, aka pink slime, was for many years to Taco Bell burritos. Now, kamaboko has a long history in Japan. Legend has it that kamaboko was first cooked up by the questionably historical Empress Jingu who also happened to be the first woman featured on a Japanese banknote, though presumably not for her culinary inventiveness. The generally accepted story, traced by the enthusiastic fish paste historian Shimizu Wataru through a series of manuscripts and scrolls, is that the first recorded mention of kamaboko was during the Heian period, when a product resembling what is now called chikuwa was reportedly served at a court banquet in the year 1115. Despite persistent suggestions that fish paste was actually introduced to Japan from China or Southeast Asia, perhaps through Okinawa, the All Japan Kamaboko Federation has enthusiastically embraced the Heian Genesis date, establishing November 15th, 1115 as National Kamaboko Day. 2015 was accordingly celebrated as the 900th anniversary of Kamaboko. And in the feverish world of processed foods marketing in Japan, a campaign was then immediately launched to excite consumers about the impending millennium of fish paste. In any case, despite the efforts of Kamaboko boosters to stress its elite culinary origins, there were clearly very practical reasons for the development of fish paste products. Grinding meat with salt and cooking it was a useful means of extending the shelf life of fish in a pre-refrigerated world. And even though kamaboko has not always been made with the least desirable raw materials, either in terms of fish species or freshness, it is unquestionably in the spirit of being the ocean's Velveeta, a convenient vehicle for dodgy ingredients. As one earnest food scientist put it, even small fish, fish with bad taste, fish with many bones, and fish with grotesque appearances can be eaten by processing them into kamaboko. The making of kamaboko is straightforward, if tedious and tiring in the days before mechanization. Traditionally, the meat was removed from fish and minced. It was washed with water and then squeezed dry using a hemp cloth before being ground with salt in a stone mortar and pestle. The resulting paste, fresh surimi, would then be shaped and steamed, boiled, or baked. This process removes oils, impurities, and water-soluble proteins from the ground meat, leaving a high concentration of proteins which, when heated, form an elastic gel. These proteins break down or denature quickly after a fish dies, so the fresher the raw materials used, the better the elastic texture. Significantly, come the 20th century, 
Freezing fish also has the effect of denaturing proteins, meaning Kamaboko manufacturers, manufacturers remained dependent on fresh or relatively fresh fish, even in an age of emerging refrigerated cold chains. And just to complicate things further, not all types of fish have the same gel forming properties. Some, especially white fish like croaker, are rich in the desirable proteins, while others, especially oily dark flesh fish like mackerel, cannot yield the kind of snappy ashi that Kamaboko connoisseurs crave. A remarkable diversity of local variations of Kamaboko emerged across Japan. As makers developed products based on local fish catches, other readily available local ingredients and local taste preferences. Japan's rich Kamaboko foodways have been compared justifiably, I think, to the elaborate cultures of cheese or wine in Europe. In Odawara to the south of uh, Tokyo, famous for its fish paste, a fish called okigisu or whiting was made into itatsuke kamaboko, the now iconic half round shape on a wooden board famous for its brilliant whiteness, glossy sheen, and strong ashi. In Edo, the specialty was hampen, a fluffy boiled kamaboko made from shark meat and mashed yam. It is sometimes called the marshmallow of the sea. In Toyohashi, it was chikuwa with its distinctive bamboo tube shape and made from lizard fish. The port of Yaizu is associated with the pink swirled Narutomaki, which is one of only two Neri Seihin to rate its own emoji. And in Kagoshima in the south, influences from Okinawa gave birth to deep fried kamaboko, now generally known as Satsuma Age. Over the last 50 years, the plasticity of surimi has allowed for the fabrication of a mind numbing and stomach churning range of what are called analog products, engineered imitations of more costly foods. The most successful of these have, has been kanikama, crab sticks, of which more in a moment. One of the strangest is surimi based matsutake mushrooms, and among the most recent is an unagi substitute developed in response to the soaring prices and dwindling populations of freshwater eels. Now, legendary empresses and heian banquets notwithstanding, it was only in the Tokugawa period that regular widespread production of kamaboko is documented. Even well after the Meiji Restoration, the making of kamaboko remained artisanal, localized, and small in scale, dependent on unpredictable and seasonal local catches of fish, and limited by transportation networks and the slow development of refrigeration facilities. Moreover, through World War II and until the 1960s, fish remained a relatively small part of the Japanese diet. This is something not a lot of people know. Really, until the 1960s, the Japanese couldn't afford to eat a lot of fish. Even at its pre-war peak, daily consumption of fish and shellfish in Japan was less than 40 grams or 1.3 ounces uh, per person. So about uh, uh, eight ounces a person a week uh, of fish uh, was it. The development of the West Trawl, Japan's first modern offshore fishery, began in 1908 with the arrival of a British-built otter trawler in Nagasaki and transformed the kamaboko industry. The Japanese fleet grew, grew quickly over the next two decades and swept the Yellow and East China Seas, initially focusing on high-value fish, especially sea bream. But catches of bream soon declined under intense fishing pressure and the trawlers increasingly returned to port with bottom species not popular among Japanese consumers, especially croaker. Because of the exceptional gel forming properties of croaker, it could be transported great distances, even with minimal refrigeration, and still be made into good quality kamaboko. With more regular supply of raw materials, the kamaboko industry then grew steadily, starting in the mid-1920s. Production increased from 17,000 tons in 1926 to 185,000 tons in 1941. 
manufacturers remained small scale before the war. And even though new mechanical technology, mincers, grinders, and mixers was widely introduced, the production process continued to be labor intensive and based on job lots of available fish rather than progressing to anything resembling full mass production. The coming of the Pacific War, needless to say, hamstrung not just the Japanese fishing industry, but also kamaboko makers. During the war, as raw material supply plummeted, output and quality declined. But after the surrender, production recovered remarkably rapidly, despite occupation and Korean restrictions on Japanese trawling, and kamaboko output surpassed the pre-war peak by 1953. The most important post-war boost to the industry was the development of fish sausage as an inexpensive and popular new consumer item. Experimentation with creating sausage from surimi began in the 1930s, but it was only in 1947 when Nippon Suisan pioneered a product combining ground fish with animal fat that the idea took flight. The burgeoning fish sausage industry was buoyed not just by a post-war generation with a taste for fattier foods, animal protein, and Western-style products, but also by technological advances and changes in seafood markets. The development of hydrochloric rubber casings and the approval of chemical preservatives allowed for fish sausages that did not need refrigeration, and automation of the manufacturing process allowed for production at scale. Importantly, fish sausage was initially made from tuna, which was in plentiful supply after the war and was particularly inexpensive after the Lucky Dragon incident of 1954. This is where a Japanese tuna fishing boat strayed into the American H-bomb testing range uh, near Bikini Atoll. Uh, the Lucky Dragon incident raised public concerns about irradiated seafood from the South Pacific, uh, and that made tuna particularly cheap. Whale meat, I should also note, was also widely used in fish sausage. Uh, and here's an interesting product I discovered recently, retro sausage uh, made with whale, promising, quote, the taste and feel of the Showa period. At the same time, production of traditional kamaboko was also on the upswing. The development of cold chains and the supply and distribution of seafood products was critical to this growth. For example, the proportion of Japanese households with refrigerators soared from only 10% in 1960 to almost 90% seven years later. The pace of incremental improvements in processing machinery from more efficient fillet cutters to the retainer molding method accelerated and boosted productivity. As personal incomes rose, the consumption of seafood products increased and with the coming of supermarkets starting in 1953 in Japan, standardized products that were convenient and quick to prepare like kamaboko were in high demand. Kamaboko manufacturers soon found, however, that Japan's fisheries could not keep up. Although the West trawl increasingly focused on supplying the kamaboko trade and Japanese boats kept moving into new fishing grounds along the coastlines of Asia, supply of key species like croakers stagnated, limiting further growth and production. The breakthrough that would transform the kamaboko industry came in 1960 from a scientist named Nishia Kyosuke, who worked at the Hokkaido Fisheries Research Laboratory. Nishia made a fortuitous discovery while exploring ways of producing fish sausage from Alaska pollock, also known as walleye pollock. There had long been a small pollock fishery in Hokkaido. The salted roe, the egg sacs uh, of the fish, known in Japanese as tarako, had a market in Japan and was highly prized in Korea, where pollock was a major commercial species. But Japanese consumers had no taste for pollock, which has soft flesh that spoils quickly after catch. Pollock was considered a trash fish, and beyond seasonal roe harvesting, was either used for fish meal production or discarded as bycatch. What Nishia found was that sugars could be used as cryoprotectants in the manufacture of Pollock surimi. 
In other words, if glucose, sucrose, or sorbitol were added to the surimi, it could be frozen for long periods of time without the loss of its gel-forming properties. For the Neri Sahin industry, this meant not only that a previously underutilized plentiful species was now available for kamaboko, it also meant that producers were no longer dependent on fluctuating supplies of fresh fish. Frozen surimi, a new commodity, could be produced anywhere on the globe, stored indefinitely, and could, in sufficient quantities, allow at last for full-scale flow mass production of fish paste products from harvest through final packaging and distribution. While Hokkaido pollock catches declined in the late 1950s, another far richer source of raw materials soon presented itself. Japanese trawlers first worked the waters of the Eastern Bering Sea off the coast of Alaska in 1933, catching bottom fish for processing into fish meal. In 1954, both Nisui and Taiyo Gyogyo sent factory ships into the same area to produce frozen sole and flounder. What these fleets also found was an abundance of pollock. So in 1965, the first factory ship equipped to process frozen surimi on board worked the Bering Sea. The size of the pollock resources were such that other factory ships and stern trawlers were soon outfitted and trawlers were reallocated from the stagnant West Trawl to Alaska waters. The surimi boom of the late 1960s and early 1970s was stunning. Pollock catches increased almost fourfold between 1965 and 1972. Frozen surimi production from the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska swelled from 8,000 tons in 1965 to a peak of almost 218,000 tons in 1973, when 22 factory ships worked the waters. In 1973, Kamaboko production hit an all-time record of nearly 1.2 million pounds, 90% of it produced from frozen pollock surimi, and the pollock fishery, which had hardly registered in Japan's national statistics before 1965, made up fully one third of the Japanese fishing industry's total catch. But a boom like that, needless to say, and as these charts suggested, could not last. Environmental limitations were one issue. After a decade of heavy exploitation, even the very rich pollock fishery was showing signs of stress. An even greater concern though, was the apparent saturation of the Japanese Neri Seihin market. In 1973, a remarkable 37% of Japanese seafood consumption was in the form of kamaboko. But consumers soon tired of so much fish, fish paste, especially as ultra low temperature freezing technology and rising incomes boosted the supply of and demand for higher end seafood products, especially tuna. Kamaboko consumption plateaued in the 1970s and then began a long-term decline that continues to the present day. Technological innovations helped avert a complete bust in the surimi industry, however. In the early 1970s, two Japanese kamaboko producers developed kanikama, imitation crab meat, made from flavored and flaked surimi. Described as the greatest achievement of the post-war seafood processing industry, Crab stick was a commercial hit in Japan and was soon a runaway success internationally, especially in the United States, where it was cannily marketed to food service firms and where crab prices were skyrocketing due to the collapse of the Alaskan king crab fishery in 1980. Not surprisingly, Japan's domination of the Pollock fishery off the coast of Alaska its development of a new processed food commodity and a surge in Japanese crab stick exports, exports caught the attention of American fishing interests and politicians. The onslaught of Japanese imitation crab, a new staple in Subway sandwiches and California rolls, was dramatically described by one seafood industry analyst as a Sputnik moment for US fishers and processors. 
With Alaskan crabbers suffering, calls to Americanize the Pollock fishery grew louder and helped accelerate the oceanic enclosure movement, which had been building steam since World War II in the US and globally. Consequently, in 1976, Washington declared a 200 mile fishery conservation zone, later formalized as an e exclusive economic zone or EEZ along America's coasts, essentially absorbing all the grounds where Japan had been harvesting Pollock and producing surimi into US national territory. Under the American Fisheries Protect Promotion Act of 1980, new criteria were established for fishing rights in US waters. This was later dubbed the fish and chips policy that traded catch quotas for improved market access, investments in the American seafood industry or technology transfer to American producers. Under fish and chips, just as American policymakers had planned, Japanese boats were progress progressively excluded from harvesting Pollock in the US EEZ. But Japan's influence in the surimi industry did not simply disappear. The big Japanese seafood companies and trading firms began investing in joint venture factory ships and in onshore surimi processing facilities in Alaska from the mid 1980s. So while US fishers came to monopolize the Pollock capture fishery, the larger surimi industry was not Americanized, but instead was globalized, integrated into transnational supply and production chains with substantial Japanese involvement in processing, trade, and distribution, and key Japanese contributions of capital, knowledge, and technology. The ripples from Japan's ouster from the Alaska Pollock fishery did not end there, however. In the 1970s, a significant population of Pollock was discovered in an area called the Donut Hole, part of the Aleutian Basin outside American, Soviet and, uh, American and Soviet territorial waters. The Japanese trawlers displaced by the fish and chips policy headed straight for these unclaimed grounds in the mid 1980s and were soon joined by fleets of Soviet, Korean, Polish and Chinese ships. The catch was phenomenal, rising to 1.7 million tons by 1987 and the subsequent collapse was equally dramatic. Only 10,000 tons were harvested from the donut, donut hole in 1992 and by 2007, the Pollock biomass in the area had declined by 98% from its peak. One scientist described the emptying of the donut hole as, quote, among the most spectacular fisheries collapses to occur in the modern history of fisheries in the Northern Hemisphere. With each setback, however, Japanese scientists and fisheries firms just seemed to work harder to find untapped new sources of fish to provide raw materials for domestic kamaboko demand and jobs for Japanese fishers and processors. Inevitably, this involved looking further down the marine food web to find species that were not well suited to surimi production or were long considered unfit for human consumption. In the 1960s and 70s, for instance, government labs discovered means of producing low quality commercial surimi used mainly in fried products like satsuma age from dark skinned fish like mackerel and sardines. Species long harvested mainly for fish meal like Pacific whiting and jack mackerel became significant sources of surimi, as did a variety of tropical fish especially one called threadfin bream, usually considered a bycatch or trash fish in Southeast Asia. Even giant squid were not safe as more than 5,000 tons of surimi a year were produced in Peru until stocks diminished. And amazingly enough, Japanese government scientists managed to produce serviceable surimi from Antarctic krill in the 1970s before abandoning the project, at least for the time being. So where does that all leave us today? 905 years after a plate of chikuwa first graced a Heian banquet. 
Today, Surimi and Kamaboko, including analog products, are truly global industries. Up to 70% of the surimi produced today is traded internationally. And both surimi and crab sticks are made around the globe, thanks to Japanese firms that established subsidiaries, started joint ventures, or equipped local manufacturers from Chile to the Faroe Islands to India. Today, the largest imitation crab factory in the world is either in Plungay, Lithuania, or in Motley, Minnesota. And between them, they produce more fish paste a year than Japan as a whole did before World War II. Local catches may still be used for craft kamaboko production in coastal Japan, but after a century of draining fish stocks across the Pacific and venturing ever further down the food web for marine protein, surimi is produced from dozens of species of fish and invertebrates from all the major oceans in the world. Japan is still very much a major player in the production and consumption of fish paste products, but the surimi and kamaboko industries have very much paralleled the rise and fall of Japanese fisheries over the 20th century. Japan's fishing industry was the largest uh, in, in the world uh, from the early 1930s until 1988, with the exception of a few years during and after World War II. Japan was also the world's largest exporter of seafood products through that period, canned crab, tuna, and salmon, frozen tuna and swordfish, fish meal and oil, and for a few booming years in the 1980s, surimi and crab sticks. The same forces, though, that hit Japan's capture fisheries, depletion of fish stocks, territorialization of important fishing grounds, rising oil and labor prices, also hamstrung the fleets that supplied the surimi industry. Other winds buffeted Japan, Japanese seafood exports, which slipped from the world's top spot in 1978. Growing domestic demand, the politics of trade liberalization, foreign exchange swings, and in the case of surimi and tuna as well, the globalization of marine supply chains as Japanese companies took advantage of fish stocks in other nations' EEZs, low cost overseas processing and newly opened Japanese import markets. The new millennium brought dramatic drops in Japanese kamaboko consumption and production. The number of kamaboko manufacturers in Japan plunged from over 3,000 in the 1980s to under 2,000 in 2005 to only 946 in 2011. Analysts direly predicted further declines to what were called cultural consumption levels, that is for use mainly as a New Year's tradition, and the relegation of fish sausage to distribution as emergency provisions uh, after uh, natural disasters. Uh, and it fulfilled this role perfectly uh, after 311 when uh, a lot of the aid packages uh, to survivors uh, included uh, uh, Kamaboko. Kamaboko's troubles have certainly been related to a long-term shift away from fish and toward meat, especially among younger generations of Japanese, and even intensive marketing aimed at youth, enthusiastically led by ever chipper and presumably extremely elastic mascots for the Kamaboko industry, Kamapi and Chikoru, has been unable to turn the tide. And if you want to see it, there is a wonderful uh, video on YouTube uh, of the mascots uh, doing, doing an exercise routine. It's got a song that just stays in your mind forever. In closing, at last, I suspect I may not be alone uh, in feeling that it seems quite odd, even perverse, to be spending so much time thinking about Japanese fish paste in the midst of a grueling and deadly global pandemic at a time when racial justice demands our action and just days after an unprecedented attack on the US Capitol. At the current moment, it is perfectly understandable that the industrialization of the oceans, fishing down marine food webs, and the advance of engineered seafood is unlikely to make any of our personal top 10 or top 100 or even top 1000 lists of things to worry about. But they probably should as the same kind of environmental exploitation, 
acute commercial competition, rapid technological innovation, and relentless global demand for seafood products that fueled the rise of surimi and the transformation of the Kamaboko industry is sure to continue to drive world fisheries. Already, it seems another race to the bottom of marine food webs is well underway as aquaculture, which has grown more than fivefold over the past three decades, has driven demand for fish meal. But since the advent of industrial surimi has made so many trash fish available for human consumption, the meal producers will have to go even further, deeper, and smaller for species and biomass to process. So even if that distinctive elasticity doesn't put you off Kamaboko, the vision of global ocean swept clean for another imitation crab stick just might. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. I very much uh, look forward uh, to your questions, uh, uh, comments, and personal recollections of eating Kamaboko. So thanks very much, Bill. Really appreciate that. Um, so once again, a reminder to our uh, attendees, uh, I'm monitoring the chat function. So uh, please, if you have questions for Bill, uh, feel free to share it in the chat and we can move on with that. But I do have, you know, as part of my function, I do have a couple of questions um, standing by uh, while others roll in. So the first is just kind of a comment that you noted that you know, all of this really accelerates in the 1960s. And I think this is just you know, another bit of evidence that the Japan we know really is a product of the 1960s. You know, I think that that it very much is uh, is true. And I think is, is very much overlooked uh, uh, even by people uh, in the field. I think there are a lot of people who assume uh, uh, sort of without really thinking much about it, the Japanese always ate a lot of fish and the Japanese always ate rice, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and the reality is fish only became a major part of the Japanese diet in the 1960s. And rice was a, you know, very late 19th, early 20th century uh, introduction. There's a wonderful piece that Eric Rath wrote on the history of Japanese food that's said, you know, we should consider acorns and millet the staple foods uh, of Japan, because through most of history, that's what peasants ate. Okay, so we have our first question, um, which is, I generally think of processed meat as less nutritionally valuable. Is this true of fish paste, crab sticks, etc.? Well, let me just let me just you know think whether I'm going to put on my corporate hat or my individual hat uh, for this one. If you listen to the Kamaboko industry, uh, it is a miracle food, right? And indeed, there is a lot to recommend it about Kamaboko. Uh, as someone who is always watching his waist, it is a very low calorie uh, food, high protein, low calorie, uh, and so nutritionally, it does have uh, uh, much to offer. Is it as good for you as eating a piece of fish? I sincerely doubt it. Uh, it has been marketed as health food, you know, part of this craze for eating uh, 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 fish products and the various uh, kinds of oils and uh, acids uh, within them. The reality is uh, it's a bit like eating uh, processed soybeans. A lot of the good stuff, the fiber and so forth, has been taken out in that processing uh, uh, process uh, in order to make it uniform and uh, malleable in to different uh, products, uh, and I believe the same is true uh, of, uh, of Kamaboko. I'll also say one interesting observation that's made, if you start running uh, uh, the health effects uh, of Kamaboko, you get hundreds of articles in both English and Japanese on databases. One of the most interesting ones I found uh, was related to the changing demographics of Japan. There are simply more older people in Japan it turns out every year there are a substantial number of jaw injuries to older Japanese people from eating particularly elastic kamaboko. Uh, and so uh, there is the worry uh, that manufacturers are going to have to make softer kamaboko as the Japanese population ages so people don't hurt themselves eating it. Hmm. So um, first of all, uh, what was the other Neti say him that earned its own emoji. Ah, that, so that is, there is, uh, so this is a technical point. I've had an argument about this. Uh, in fact, it is one of the skewers that comes in uh, Oden uh, that has a uh, chikua uh, uh, on it. So really it's about a third of an emoji. Uh, and, and you know, depending on how well drawn it is, depending on which uh, computer platform you're on, it looks more like uh, 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 Kamaboko than it does in others, so. <laughs> okay. 
So Barbara Mason uh, asks regarding um, uh, about what is you know the attractiveness for uh, Japanese of rubbery food in particular. You know, does that tie in with mochi at all? Yeah, you know, I think it does tie in with mochi very well. It also ties in with things like uh, octopus, you know, uh, and other snack products. People like things that have a little fight to them uh, in Japan. And I think that is just uh, uh, something about national taste uh, that mm. people have developed uh, perhaps a broader range uh, of uh, 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 sort of textural preferences uh, than we have uh, in this country. I realize as, you know, I was eating my lunch today uh, that uh, the textures are not the, we got, you know, crunchy and chewy and, you know, soft and so forth. Uh, but we really don't eat a lot of that snappy, elastic uh, kind of food uh, uh, in this country. Uh, and in Japan, it seems to be much more uh, mainstream. I do not know when that occurred, you know? That's a, it's a really good question to sort of trace that uh, historically uh, and what products the Japanese might have been eating in great quantities in earlier centuries that produced this. Uh, and Albert Wong is curious to know what are some of the perhaps less beneficial additives, chemicals, food coloring uh, that might appear in Kamaboko. So if you go back and look at old Japanese newspapers uh, about headlines featuring Kamaboko, before about the 1970s, almost every headline about Kamaboko related to food poisoning or adulteration in one way or another. The headlines were things like 22 sickened at wedding reception by Kamaboko. <laughs> you know? And you know, it simply was, this was a way of hiding uh, uh, less than fresh ingredients. Uh, and especially in the days before there were sophisticated food additives, uh, preservatives uh, that you could add, they tended to go off. Saccharin, when it was first introduced, uh, was thought to be dangerous to people. I mean, maybe it is dangerous to people. Maybe we still think that uh, now, but saccharin was a no-no. And yet it was much cheaper than sugar. Sugar is added to a lot of Kamaboko products. And so some people would try to sneak saccharin in. So that was often uh, an issue. And then there were other chemicals that have been proven to be carcinogens that were in the past using Kamaboko and they had to stop uh, using it. The whole idea of food safety around Kamaboko is really an interesting topic, uh, just as it is in Japan in general. Uh, of course, after Fukushima, the idea of radiation in Kamaboko uh, was a big issue. Miyagi Prefecture, you know, where the uh, very close to where the earthquake struck, uh, is one of Japan's largest Kamaboko producers. And even though most of the Kamaboko produced there comes from Surimi off the coast of Alaska, people really worried that it was gonna be radioactive. Mm -hmm. So Faye Beecham is also wondering, um, not so much about texture, but about flavor. So how do you actually make something that actually has no crab in it taste like crab? <laughs> Horribly enough, I have read an article about this. Uh, and so, what it, it, you know, when you talk about the great advances that took place, you know, one was the technology to make crab sticks. And if you've eaten a crab stick recently, you'll notice it is pretty sophisticated, actually, the way in which the layers are wrapped. So it seems sort of crabby uh, in its texture. Uh, and the way that it has the red color around the outside to look the way that king crab uh, does. Uh, one of the other things they had to develop was a affordable crab flavoring. So essentially what they did was to find a way to reuse the water that was used in king crab production when they, wa when they uh, uh, boil it, reuse that water and reuse the shells and other refuse in other like waste products to distill that down into crab essence. Uh, because one of the things about surimi is surimi is essentially tasteless, more or mm -hmm. less like textured soy protein. It's just no, no flavor left in it. So you have to add the flavor back in. I know people who've never had uh, kamaboko before like that, you know, the famous pink half round kamaboko on the board, Itatsuke kamaboko, think, mm -hmm. oh, it's going to taste fishy. It doesn't really taste like anything. Uh, it's the texture that it's all about. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that because they're injecting crab essence uh, into artificial crab, uh, I would still be allergic to it. <laughs> I, I would not. I would just stay away from it, Paul. <laughs> yes, well, that's 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 definitely part of the plan. So, um, I'm wondering if you're doing this in the future. Have you given some thought to what the story of unagi um, adds to this? Yeah, you know, uh, it is interesting. I think that, you know, Anagi is one of those classic uh, 
uh, uh, cases where uh, 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 the supply is limited, you know, for uh, 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 environmental uh, reasons. Uh, as uh, uh, demand for unagi went up, there have been some big booms in unagi consumption uh, in Japan. The prices uh, have spiked, uh, but it really looked like unagi was going to become extinct at one point. Uh, now I think they've pulled back uh, from the brink, but there really just is not enough to go around. Uh, and so uh, they have, uh, uh, I do not know how the uh, uh, fake unagi uh, made out of surimi tastes. It does not appeal to me terribly much uh, as I look uh, at that product there. But I had a friend just send me uh, a, a picture of a gift he'd gotten. You know how Japanese love giving each other gifts of food? Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, frankly, getting a gift of kamaboko does not seem like the best gift I would ever receive. But he received a Christmas gift uh, from a company of uh, kamaboko oysters. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, that's such a weird texture to begin with. And then trying to make that out of kamaboko. And I don't think there's a huge, like, supply shortage of oysters right now, but you know, you know, uh, but I, I do think, you know, one of the food scientists always hope um, that they're gonna solve the world's problems by engineering a substitute product that can be made from cheap, widely ex uh, uh, available, uh, environmentally friendly products uh, that can save something else uh, or allow more people to enjoy something. Uh, unfortunately, it always just seems pretty much second best, I think. Mm. So we still have about you know five minutes left, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your monster class is going. Well, so uh, this semester I've developed for the first time. I it's amazing I've gone this long in my career, 25 plus years, and have never taught Japanese monsters. So I decided to put together together a class this spring uh, at Harvard on Japanese monsters, uh, and I've had a huge amount of fun with it. We are going from sort of the dawn of time, so we're starting with the Kojiki uh, and the monsters of Japanese mythology uh, up to uh, Amabie, you know, and uh, uh, the monsters that are flying around on social media today. Uh, related uh, to the pandemic. Uh, it's unusual compared to a lot of other Japanese monster courses out there. So there are some really fine ones uh, uh, out there done at Columbia and uh, SUNY Buffalo and Toronto and elsewhere. Uh, but uh, mine really tries to balance the pre-modern and the modern. Uh, so instead of focusing just on the Tokugawa period and Tale of Genji and other great sources uh, like that, we're gonna spend a lot of time uh, in the post-war uh, period looking of course at giant monsters uh, mm -hmm. Godzilla uh, and so forth, but also at things a lot of people don't think about in Japan, like cryptozoology. Is there a Japanese Bigfoot? Do Japanese uh -huh. people believe they're being probed uh, by UFOs? Uh, and one of my favorite topics, I think about half the class signed up to talk about this, is Hello Kitty a monster? Uh, <laughs> there's been a lot of literature recently saying that the cute is monstrous. Uh, and mm -hmm. so uh, I've had almost 50 people uh, sign up uh, for the class, which is uh, more than I had uh, reckoned, uh, and they're real enthusiastic. We had our first class yesterday, and uh, we got to show some Teletubbies and Cookie Monster, and it was good fun. Excellent. Well, so I want to thank you very much. We've come to the end of our time, so thanks once again to Bill, uh, to members of the JSA board, to Dawn Gale in particular, and Jody Dietz, Sarah Bios, and Isaiah Rigsby uh, of the JCCC CoLab, co uh, and the University of Kansas uh, Center for East Asian Studies for their support. Our next program will be Thursday, Feb uh, Thursday, February 25th, uh, from 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, that's 10 a.m. in Hawaii. Uh, Professor Elisa Freeman, University of Oregon, will join us to discuss Japan on American TV. Since the 1950s, U.S. television programs have served as curators of Japan, displaying and explaining selected aspects for viewers. An historical examination of the diversity of Japan portrayals show changing patterns of cultural globalization and the perpetuation of national stereotypes while, ver while verifying Japan's international influence. Television presents us an alternative history of American fascination with and fears of Japan. So information on that and the rest of our program schedule can be found on the JSA website, japanstudies.org. Uh, thanks everyone very much. Um, it was lovely to see or, you know, visit with all of you uh, and have a wonderful day. So thanks very much and thanks for attending. See you next month. <laughs>